let me, let me do that all over again. Uh, <laughs> Welcome everyone, uh, I'm Nancy Florine, uh, at-large member of the County Council. This is uh, part of our series of forums we do periodically uh, to bring people of different backgrounds and needs together and try to help them sort out whatever issues they have uh, and to uh, share with you who the resources are. Uh, before we get started, I, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, we're gonna end at nine o'clock tonight. Uh, we are taping this. Uh, so we're asking folks to come up to the mic when you have a qu question, uh, and we have a whole star-studded cast of people we hope will know the answers uh, within the county uh, government, uh, particularly with respect to uh, uh, homeowners association condo issues. We rarely deal, deal directly with you. We tend to deal with more with civic type uh, issues, but not so much condo association issues. So we thought we'd give this a shot and see if we can be useful. So as I said, because you're taped, don't forget to smile. Um, I, and our goal here with taping it is that we will be able to share with you uh, uh, a link to the tape, and also we hope to put together a summary of what's uh, shared at this session. So that can be a resource for you and your HOA or condo association as you move forward. Uh, I'm a former member of the uh, county planning board uh, many, many years ago, and I feel a little guilty because I approved a whole bunch of communities in which you probably all live now uh, that had HOAs. Uh, we, we created HOAs before my time, of course, uh, but to allow you to have control over some of the things in your community. And I know it's a big job uh, to shoulder that responsibility. So I want to thank you on behalf of everybody else for what you do. Uh, you probably don't get a lot of thanks. I've heard, got an earful already about the beaver problem. Uh, and I know that there are other kinds of issues in terms of uh, how you collect your dues, uh, stormwater management, and well, I'm sure you will tell us uh, what your concerns are. Uh, let me introduce my staff in the back there is Stephen Brimer. Sh raise your hand, Stephen, if you haven't signed in yet, or if you have a particular question, check with Stephen, and that's how we'll get, uh, we'll get you on our list. Then up front we have Judy Jablo, my chief of staff, and Jocelyn Rawat, who will help uh, with any issues that you have as well. We have, as I said, a star-studded cast of folks here from the county offices. We have Jay Ru Banda, for, director of the East County. Raise your hand, Jay Ru. So if you live in the East County, if we don't get your questions answered, you ask Jay Ru. Uh, I'm not sure if Rimberto's here yet. He's a director of the, um, of the Silver Spring Center. Ken Hartman from Ch Bethesda Chevy Chase. Kathy Matthews is here from the Up County. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if uh, Anna Van Valen is here yet from the Mid-County. She's not going to make it tonight. So they're all going to take charge of that. Uh, Nadim Khan is here from Health and Human Services. So if you have an issue that falls into that category, he's your resource. Our uh, Reggie Jetter here is, is here from Permitting Services. Got issues? Oh, yeah. I got those issues. Here he is. <laughs> we have the boss of them all, Eric Friedman, who's the director of the Office of... Uh, consumer Protection, and Peter Dramalski, who staffed the Commission on Com Common Ownership Communities. Presumably, you have dealt with them, or at least seen a piece of paper with their name on it. This is what they look like. Um, we have Steve Sofar here from DEP. Uh, all your environmental problems, see Steve. Uh, we have Rick Nelson here from the uh, Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Uh, housing issues, he's your man. Uh, Walter Wilson, he's our expert here on um, condo law and the like, and I know we have a couple of other attorneys here uh, as resources, maybe here to argue with Walter. Uh, uh, Pam Dunn and Gwen Wright are here from the Pl County Planning Commission. They're the ones that probably created your HOA, uh, but they're also a resource for planning issues. Uh, from DOT, we have Bruce Johnson and Gary Ehrenrich. Uh, so your transportation road issues, they're your guys. From the police, we have Commander James Fenner and Lieutenant Jack, Jack Kroom. Um, so I hope you didn't get any tickets on the way over. They will not fix them, but they can uh, respond to uh, public safety issues. 
Um, there are more than, we think, about 60 organizations represented here tonight, including homeowners associations, condo owner associations, co-op boards, management companies, and nonprofits. I ask you to visit our literature table outside the room, and you may have received some already. That's a wealth of information about our county departments. And as I said, um, please um, uh, be sure to sign in and to smile when you speak. Uh, before we get started, I want to tell you, I, I think this is not, it was not, it's sort of coincidental. Got an email this week from someone who was pretty cross about a variety of county issues. And this person very legitimately said, why didn't you ask me about this and that and the other? These are all issues that have implications for my community. And we want to weigh in. We want to make sure that the county government, the county council, the county executive knows of the impact of these issues on us. And I will tell you, I second that point. It is very hard for us to get input from the community. Uh, we do our best. We have email. We have, we really, people really don't use mail much anymore. Uh, we have a lot of electronic uh, connections, but they're not sufficient. It's absolutely true. Uh, if you can think of a better way for us to, to reach out to you, please let us know. I have a monthly newsletter. If you'd be so kind as, if you've signed up, we'll put you on our mailing li email list. And we do our best to let folks know what's going on. Um, uh, there also is a county uh, council uh, newsletter that I was instrumental in getting started that you can also sign up for online. The information is in the newsletter handout that I have. And that's another way, a brand new way, it's actually something we haven't done for a number of years uh, to keep people posted. One of the challenges I believe we have with uh, HOAs and condo associations and uh, I've seen it over the years as you have management companies. Some of you are management companies, perhaps. Um, uh, and the, the information that's sent out may not go to the board members or directors. Uh, that's something that I would encourage you to sort out amongst yourselves. Um, the Park and Planning Commission is um, supposed to maintain a list of all the civic associations and HOAs in the county. Um, and there, there are obligations for developers to let folks around know when they have a project pending. But we don't pretend that our lists are perfect, uh, so we need you to help us make sure that our com communication devices are working. So I, I ask you, I beg of you, um, to uh, tell us where we fail in this regard so we can try to beef it up. Uh, we're doing our very best, so I want you to know that. I thought I'd take just a minute um, to tell you what the council is up to these days. Uh, and then um, I, I know you all have a lot of questions, so I really, this will be a be better meeting when uh, you get to take charge. Uh, some of the um, issues pending right now before us, there is a minimum wage bill. We're having a public hearing on that on tomorrow night. Uh, one thing about this county council, though, is that if you cannot make it to a public hearing, that's okay. Send us an email or a letter, and we will put it in the file and, and read it and pay attention to your thoughts. Coming to a public hearing is not the only way to communicate with us. Believe me, uh, we, get, we get emails up until the minute that we vote on things, and um, it's very important that you know that you can do that. Uh, the earlier that you get your comments in on an issue, the better because our staff will have a chance to evaluate it and there's a staff packet and all that stuff is available on, the, on our website. Uh, but most importantly, uh, I want you to know that if you miss that, that's okay. Keep, keep those thoughts and comments going. And that also holds true for issues that are out there generally. Uh, if you see an issue in the newspaper or hear of an issue in the, in the community that you don't feel has been addressed, please let us know. Uh, there are four of us at large members. Uh, there are five district council members, and I'll just note uh, the staff is here for uh, Hans Reamer's office. This is, I'm just getting to know her, Jennifer Hosey. So um, raise your hand, Jennifer. But all of, he's another of the at-large members. There are four of us who are at-large and five district people. That means, theoretically, you have uh, uh, five of us, which is a majority of our nine member council on your side. That's the theoretic democratic theory, and it, 
it, it's, and I want you to know and feel um, that you have access to us all. Uh, we also have uh, Susan Hoffman, I'm reminded here, is here for the Recreation Department. Raise your hand, Susan. Uh, and we have Chris Gillis uh, from George Leventhal's office. He's back in the back. Don't hide now, Chris. He, uh, again, another at-large person. Um, as I said, we have a bill pending on uh, minimum wage, uh, and that will be, um, uh, will be, that'll be heard on Thursday. Uh, we're in the middle of, well, we're near the end of rewriting the zoning ordinance. You may have questions about that. By and large, it won't affect established communities. Uh, it will affect some of our commercial areas. We'll be adding some, the potential for some uh, residential uh, uses in commercial areas, but we're not ch proposing to change the density or um, anything like that. Um, we are also uh, considering a proposal for a bus rapid transit throughout the county. Uh, we've had public hearings on that, and we are going to have an all-day work session on that on Thursday. All of this is, information is on the website, and again, if you have issues, specifics having to do with any of that, uh, I encourage you to follow along. And then finally, um, we uh, have... Um, Fini just finish work on the Glenmont Master Plan, um, and we will um, begin probably in February or so, uh, have a public hearing on the White Oak uh, Master Plan. We're technically having a public hearing on that next Tuesday, but no, we're not really having a public hearing on it because we've asked, uh, told folks that uh, we've, we've asked the planning board to do some additional work, and we will get that back and schedule a public hearing a little bit later. Uh, what I forgot to mention about me is the reason I'm talking about all this land use and transportation stuff is because that's what I mostly do here. I chair the committee that deals with land use uh, and economic development um, and housing, and I also am a member of the uh, transportation committee that also de deals with infrastructure and transportation, environment, and that sort of thing. So. Um, uh, I'm right in the midst of uh, many of the hot issues at this moment in time. And uh, with that, are there any questions? No. If you come on down, ma'am, and uh, talk to the mic, and don't forget to smile. Hi. Um, Let's see. Is that on? Go ahead. Lisa Straker, I'm from King Farm. Uh, King Farm? Yes, King Farm. So is it is it a go that you will be building the light rail through uh, the King Farm development from Germantown through King Farm to Shady Grove? Uh, this is a question about the bus rapid transit system. Uh, as I said, we're going to have work session on these issues starting, uh, well, we've already had some. Uh, work done and uh, we're going to continue work on this. Nothing is a done deal. Uh, the proposal is to run uh, some kind of uh, bus rapid transit system of some uncertain nature uh, down Route 355. Uh, but the jury is out on what it's going to look and feel like. At this point, um, all the council is really taking up is where stations might be located and whether the county would be in a position to require additional right-of-way if they decided to fund a, fund a project. But this is some time off in the future, actually do, doing it. There's a lot of talking in, and planning in the county, but this is not entirely resolved. And we have an answer here from our staff, Gary Ehrenrich. Come on up and use the mic, Gary. Nice to meet you. Uh, Gary, Gary Ehrenrich, DOT. I just wanted to let you know that um, MTA is having a public meeting, I'm uh, looking at my calendar, for uh, Wednesday, October 30th. It's a public open house on the Corridor City's Transit Way. Um, and it's at universities in Shady Grove. Um, I believe it starts at 6 or 6.30, it's an open house. Okay, so I, mis I answered the wrong question. I answered the bus rapid transit question. And you're talking about the Carter City's transit way. Is that correct? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Gary, for straightening, straightening me out there. Uh, for the other folks, this is, uh, is 
would be also a bus rapid transit system uh, that would run, uh, it would run through the King Farm. But it's been in the plans for a long time. But there's Gary here, and if you need further information, you can follow up with him. Uh, thank you, Gary. And, and please, folks, just come on over and uh, help yourself to the mic here. This is uh, free flow. Hello. <coughs> and and it, yes, and if you could tell us your name and where you're from. My name is John Hawker. I'm president of Goldsboro Homeowners Association, right on uh, Goldsboro Road there. Uh, I have two easy questions. Uh, the first one is uh, I've asked before, and that is what is the possibility of getting the Captain John Bridge with two lanes going each way? Captain John Bridge with two lanes going each way. Uh, which of you are, uh, are Ken, Mr. Hartman? Here, you're going to need to use the mic and smile. <laughs> the, the bridge is part of the Washington Aqueduct, uh, which is uh, Army Corps of Engineers. It's also historic, so the the chances of it becoming two lanes are very slim, and it, we're not. Currently planning, no one's, no one's talked about it. Now, question number two. Question number two. My, some of my constituents have asked me, what about the possibility of creating a walking path or bicycle path down along Goldsboro Road so that people could exercise and walk and go down and connect to the canal, the canal path and uh, down at Cabin John. Uh, so there's a request for a, a, a path all the way down? Yes. Down all along Goldsboro? All along Goldsboro. How, how are we doing, Bruce, with that in our CIP? Is that on anybody's list right now? The CIP is the Capital Improvements Program uh, for the county. And, uh, Bruce Johnson with Montgomery County. We have a facility planning program in which projects like this um, are, are looked at and studied in a very close, very preliminary planning sense, and it's really not in our planning program at this time. It's something I can I can look at with our planners and see if it's something we may want to add in the future. Okay, I think we have an official request. Yes. yes. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, who's next? Yeah, you're going to have to come on down. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Joyce Fisher of your Fellows uh, Condo Association. Um, with all the development that's going on in White Flint, with the White Flint redevelopment plan, the Pike and Rose, and all the stuff that's going up on Rockville Pike, we're going to be adding lots and lots of square footage of commercial space and retail space and lots of residential. Any plans to expand roads? Give us some more infrastructure? <laughs> uh, let's let Bruce answer that. Um, White Flint is uh, one of our projects we are designing right now in final design, uh, what we call the Western Workaround in White Flint, which will uh, rearrange um, uh, Old Georgetown Road, uh, connect into Hoya Street that will rearrange Executive Boulevard, and uh, build another east-west road called uh, Main Market Street um, through the, uh, the VOB area. Um, and uh, that's kind of the first phase of that. Yeah. At just south of Pike and Rose. And then there's a longer term phase on the eastern side, which would extend uh, Executive Boulevard between White Flint Mall and, um, and Fitzgerald Auto Mall. Um, but we're a couple, well, about a year and a half or two years away from construction on the first phase on the western workaround. And the very first thing we need to do is acquire a right of way. And uh, it's anticipated all the right of way is going to be donated to us, and we're keeping our fingers crossed for that from the developers. We are designing it. We Fingers crossed. Well, they're, they're required to do this. I mean, the developers are required to pitch in. Miss Becker. Yes. Yeah. Gail Becker, Promenade on Pooks Hill Road in Bethesda. I don't think anybody here who is a non smoker or has non smoking members of their family or whoever they're living with wants to inhale secondhand smoke in their apartment or condo buildings. Uh, we're sharing walls and vents with others. And many of you 
uh, have never confronted that issue because you're, you're living around non-smokers, so you don't really realize how bad it can be. But at the promenade, where uh, we've had, had people move out of the building because of the smoke, and there's really no other condo building that I know of that they can move to. There are some smoke-free apartments. They're very expensive. There are noisy streets. So I think this is a, an issue that the county should handle rather than leaving it up to each board. No one should have to be a passive smoker in their own homes. Okay, so that's one concern. Another concern is that I've been reading about downtown Bethesda, that they want to make it more friendly to uh, millennials and the younger people, and they want to do that by bringing in more alcohol. Well, as we all know, alcohol is the source of many car accidents, noise, and crime. I don't think that's a very good idea. No, they want to loosen up the alcohol restrictions. I, I think it's more than that. Okay, so I don't think bringing in more alcohol is going to make this downtown Bethesda a more pleasant place to live and to walk around. Uh, I think safety is a much more concern, mm -hmm. much more of a concern. Uh, let's have Ken, ha Ken Hartman um, answer. He's our young guy. Uh, are, you, I, are you a millennial? Are you a millennial, Ken? How, how young? Working for the county. I, I, had no <laughs> they, I, I wish my, my colleague Anna Van Balen was here. She's uh, staffing the Nighttime Economy Task Force, which is made up of, of community members and businesses and planners and others. And it's, it's looking at a lot more than keeping bars open late at night. So they're looking at things like, um, like arts and entertainment districts, our economic development strategy, housing options. Um, there is a, a complete report that they're ready to release to the county executive. There, is, there are drafts circulating. Um, I can, you know, we can send you one if, if you want to look at it. But um, hours, of, hours of operation of, of restaurants is one, is one of the recommendations. Whether or not that succeeds at the end of the day is going to be up to um, the county executive to propose and the county council to pursue so that there's more to, to be done on this. I'm all in favor of all of the other non-alcohol um, improvements to Bethesda, okay? But I don't think loosening the alcohol restrictions is the way to go, okay? So I'm, I'm very much opposed to that. It's going to bring in more crime, more accidents, and uh, make Bethesda an unpleasant place. Okay. Th thanks, Gail. Well, we haven't received anything yet, but it's getting some press, isn't okay, so it? All so all we'll, the other we'll, ideas for improving downtown Bethesda. Okay. Downtown. There we go. Okay. Excellent. Next, sir. Uh, the issue of smoking and condos. Uh, let's ask the county uh, attorney's office, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> can, can the government regulate what happens inside condos? Well, the, um, right, we have some attorneys in the back of the room listening very carefully to what you have to say. Um, can the government regulate what happens in condos? Uh, well, I guess the government can. Uh, the the government can, um, I guess, require that you um, that you not um, that you not create a, that you not engage in activity that creates a, um, a nuisance. You can't do a nuisance uh, right. uh, in someone else's living space. So to that extent. Uh, you know the, the the county can. So. Okay. Only 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 to that extent. Oh, uh, Peter, did you want to respond to this? The county a couple of years ago passed a law banning smoking in the common areas of a condominium. You should keep that in mind. Um, smoking by itself is not illegal. Excessive smoke could be a nuisance. It's up to the board of directors to determine if the smoking amounts to a nuisance. There may be some problems uh, in the condominium if it's an old one with air leaking from one unit to another. And the board should be alert to that possibility and may have to have an inspection performed. 
to see if that situation exists. I'd like to point out that Jason Fisher is here. He is an attorney in private practice. He handled the first case on smoking to go to the Court of Special Appeals. So he's, if you want to know how to do smoking regulation properly, he would be a good person to do it. The last point I want to make is that the members of the association have the right to amend their bylaws and to prohibit smoking if they want to. You may take an amendment to your Declaration of Covenants, but it, even the covenants can be amended by the members if they have a proper majority vote. So you should keep that in mind. You're not necessarily helpless in this situation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Gail, let, let's get back to that later. We have some other folks here. Sir. Thank you. I'm Ben Smith. I'm with Crest Wickford, which is across right, the right from near the Island. States. And, uh, First, I want to give kudos to uh, the DEP folks. They've been working with us on a rainscape, and it's moving right along. We're looking forward to getting the check soon. <laughs> but it's, it's dealt with the problem area on our property, and I just want to say I think it's great, great thank you for a lot of associations to consider. But the reason I'm up here, and I already spoke to the gentleman a little bit about this, is you know, Preston Wickford, when you look down Rockville Pike from the north of the White Flint development area all the way to the Beltway, you, uh, you can't really build on the right because the subway is there. You can't expand the highway over there. The only property that is in the way of eventually widening Rockville Pike is our development. And it basically would take out the line, and, and we had the uh, Planning Commission come out when the gentleman from Calgary was uh, here and he showed us the plans and when you walk off the 75 feet for the new road with all the wonderful bus rapid transit lanes and the extra space on Rockville Pike it goes right through the back doors of our units it will be really lose about a third of our community oh I don't think that's going to happen and very, I mean, we're very happy with the White Flint Development Plan in many ways. But not but that the way. Fact that it stopped at Hillary Way and did not at all address this problem has our entire community very concerned. Because, I mean, it affects the viability of the whole community. Uh, thank you uh, for bringing that to our attention. Um, uh, Bruce can, I think, wants to address it. My, uh, right of way, as uh, your. Uh, your community should not have been built so as to extend into the existing right-of-way. But what the new right-of-way might have been, I don't know. Bruce, you want to speak to that? Yes, the um, longer term, I, mean, I talked a little bit about the other street improvements in White Flint. <clears throat> the improvement of, of Rockville Pike is a longer term project, and a, a number of questions have to be resolved before we really get into the design of that, including the bus rapid transit system and how that's going to be handled, whether it's going to be inside or outside and the like and the width of it. We're working with uh, the White Flint community um, developers in establishing a, a center line for the new right of way that the whole intent of the center line is not just to mark off 75 feet one way or another and take people's back, back, uh, back porches, but to avoid um, the as-built environment, if you will, buildings, and, and move around. In fact, the White Flint Mall is basically proposing that we move it further over on their side to avoid some of the built communities on the west side, which I think is where you are, which you, but you're south of there. Um, so we, I'd have to take a look at that, how it would impact you. I mean, our goal is not to impact people's homes and, and dislocate people. I just, um, yeah, and I, a lot of good attention is being paid. I actually, my undergraduate degree is in engineering. I was Oh, good. Scholarship yeah. that I got my engineering I'll put you on the advisory committee. But the point is, there's a lot of attention being paid to east-west uh, movement, and it's it's good. I like what I see there. But there's there's this big elephant sitting in the corner, and what we keep hearing is, well, but that's that's down the road. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. And we think it because we're the only community that's sitting right there on the pipe. We think there needs to be a little bit more attention paid to it now. Maybe while this planning is going on, they need to broaden it to encompass this one community that is directly impacted. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Bing Garthright. Um, I'm on the board of Stedwick Homes Corporation in Montgomery Village. Is this sound okay? Yeah. All right, good. I can't tell them that used to microphones. Um, there's one issue that I think the county council can really help us with a lot, and as a, I'm aware that they're already trying to help us a little bit, but I want to stress it. In Montgomery Village, as in some other homeowners associations, I'm sure, the roads were not built to county specifications for all of our little roads off locally in our neighborhoods. As a result, we own the roads. Mm -hmm. As I'm sure you know, we were getting uh, a sort of a kickback because we pay the taxes just like we You were getting a distribution. <laughs> a distribution. Uh, not a kickback. <laughs> well, I, like, I like the idea of a kickback only because when we first put the tax dollars in, the same as everybody else that gets county roads in front of their yeah. house, and yet we have our own, which uh, we also get to repay and take care of and all the rest of it. As you're aware, the state cut your transportation money, you cut our money back. Uh, we actually spend more on doing the crack fill than we get now to help maintain and replace our roads periodically. So uh, we really hope that can be fixed. The other side of that coin also is, and this is really strange, because we own those roads, they have been counted prematurely and I think erroneously as impermeable surface that we own. Mm -hmm. And so for the rainwater business, our roads, are, not only do we have to pay for them, and we're not, and we pay taxes as though we have to pay for them, but now they're being treated as though we've done something naughty and we're keeping the rainwater away from things. The odd thing is the reason our roads are small is because Kettner left more grass and woods to absorb the rainwater. Okay, so we're getting hammered in a bizarre way by that. And there's talk of some sort of a grant to offset some of that. But we're really getting hammered. We don't mind paying for our roofs. We don't mind paying for our other buildings and our tennis courts and things. But this is, this road business is, I don't know. I, I can't, I don't know why it hasn't been fixed already. It, it, it's a problem we're well aware of, the issue of the distribution of highway user dollars and uh, uh, some of the uh, tax duplication issues. And we've, I, I know we're working with Montgomery Village on that subject. Bruce, did you have any more to say? Or Gary, would you have any more to say on the money part Re return? Um, it's, I know that, p that issue is a continuing issue. Um, Steve, you want to talk about uh, the, uh, the water quality protection tax uh, that's been defined as the rain tax? As part of the, the new regulation, there's a grant program that the council added. And so uh, if you're eligible for, I'm not sure what the exact term is, but if you're eligible for the, the state reimbursement, then you can apply for a reimbursement for the impervious area and you would get, you would get reimbursed, you get a grant that would reimburse you for that. You get a, a grant for the, area, the impervious area uh, that's covered by the private road. So if you meet the eligibility for the state reimbursement or whatever it's called, you can then apply for a grant and you get that money back. Uh, Steve, do we have an easy way for homeowners associations to figure out um, that process? You can go on the website or I can give you my card. And there we go. Let's get Mr. Sofer's information out there and he will be uh, available to help folks sorting out this credit issue for uh, HOA roads. The question that goes with it though is, is the grant program going to reimburse us dollar for dollar or some fraction? And it, isn't it possible with all the resources of the county simply to study those roads and set them aside? Uh, it, does, it does reimburse you dollar for dollar. Uh, we don't have a, a list of all the roads. I think that's one of the issues is there is no comprehensive list of, of all the roads that meet this criteria or all the roads. There, there is a list. There's a list that exists, but we're not clear it's a comprehensive list, and so that's the way we dealt with it was we had people apply. That way we know they'd meet the eligibility. Okay, so there's a process, and uh, we'll have that information, uh, a way to find out that information uh, made available. So thank you, sir. That's, I think that's helpful for a lot of folks. 
Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is uh, Lee Hilling. I'm a member of the board of the Camelot Muse Homeowners Association, a townhouse complex uh, between Old Georgetown Road and behind NIH. Uh -huh. we have, yeah. uh, we have water uh, drainage issues and, and have on our property for some time, comes on to our property, of other properties, and, and from our property onto public spaces. The board would like to begin to address this, but we're concerned that it be addressed in the right way and that water management issues or whatever be considered. So my question is simply a resource question as to whether you could put us in touch with whoever could be of assistance to us to perhaps look at our issue with us and help us uh, think about some solutions. Uh, I think this is uh, another um, DEP um, question, Steve, so far, uh, who's giving out his card. Did you bring a lot of cards? I hope, lot of cards. I hope you did. <laughs> well. So uh, we have a Rainscapes program, so the, the Rainscapes program may be able to help you. Um, it, it's for putting in uh, s local stormwater like rain gardens and other things like that. So the, the program isn't necessarily set up to relieve, if you have major drainage problems, you may need something more than Rainscapes, but Rainscapes is something that could help you uh, deal with minor, minor problems. So that, that is a, a county re resource program that, that might be able to help a tad, uh, if not resolve the whole, whole uh, shebang. You can just go to um, www.montgomerycountymd.gov slash DEP, and that'll get you to the DEP website. Then when you're on the front page, there's a water. You just click on water, and that'll get you to the all the rainscapes and all the, w, the, water, the water quality protection charge and all that information. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Sarwar Faraz. I'm with the Park Ridge Homeowner Association up in Clarksburg. Um, uh, we are right off Piedmont Road, which is a very narrow rural road. Uh, and what's happening is, as Clarksburg is being developed, more and more people are cutting across from 27 to 55, going to work and back home, mm -hmm. really speeding on that road. And uh, it's, there's no margin of error, it's so narrow. Uh, one day there's gonna be a catastrophic accident and it might be one of our people who live in our neighborhood. Is it possible to have that road studied and uh, add, we can add some speed bumps on that road? Uh, this is a Mr. Johnson uh, question. What are we going to do about Piedmont Road in Clarksburg? What's the story? This has been, uh, uh, we've heard this uh, concern for some time. This is one of my, a question for one of my partners. We have a number of divisions in DOT. I am in the traffic and transportation engineering group, but in the traffic engineering group, a gentleman named Emil Willannon, and I'll give you his number. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, a speed control program, speed humps and, and traffic control program traffic calming program, but there's certain criteria that have to be met, and, and there's a certain process that's actually required by the county code that ha we have to go through to do that. So uh, I can give you his contact information and start the ball rolling with him, and he can address it. Okay. Uh, this, so the fellow who deals with these kinds of issues, I met with a, um, uh, uh, HOA, the uh, a condo association the other night who had exactly that kind of issue. Uh, Emma will on and E M I L W O L I A N I N, uh, or, or you can again email us and we'll get you to them. Uh, you, typically, uh, in these sorts of things, it's a countywide issue. Uh, we ask the rules uh, that Bruce is referring to require uh, a majority of folks in the community to ask for this sort of attention. It goes in the list and they examine uh, the concern. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Cynthia Mariel. I'm with Manor Circle Condominiums in Tacoma Park. Montgomery County was extremely instrumental in the formation of our condominium um, from a, a rented building to uh, a building that was then purchased, um, units were purchased by the renters and we became condominium owners. Right and we're extremely grateful for that assistance. 
Are you enjoying being condominium owners? It's, it's a rocky road. I bet. And we need, you have a lot of friends here, though. We need assistance once again. And the assistance we specifically need is around pursuing condominium owners who have not paid their condominium fees. I bet this happens. <laughs> yes, most recently we've been to court and for years we were in the court system to re attempting to recover mm -hmm. those fees. We just lost 15000 from one owner for non-payment and 25000 from another owner for mm -hmm. non-payment. How did you lose that? Because we were told the county laws and the state laws do not support condominium associations in recovering fees that have not been paid by condominium owners. That is the conclusion of our board, our management, um, various experts, and legal opinions. We need to find out, we need to work with you to review those policies, to review those laws, for you to advocate at the state level, and that needs to be changed because not all people who do not pay their condom fees do it because of situations that are, of, they just are not good neighbors. Mm -hmm. The cost to me out of pocket right now is $3,000. One of my neighbors, who is a teacher in the Montgomery County school system, is contemplating moving because she can no longer afford to live in this building because of non-payment of condo fees. We have to absorb the costs, and our condo fees go up, and our build, building um, repair work is not done. Mm. How can we work together to review those policies and make changes that are fair and balanced for condo minimum associations as well as condo units who are having economic. I bet there's a universal issue, huh? Uh, let, let's uh, let our Eric Friedman answer that and uh, any other uh, lawyers in the room, I suppose. Good evening. First, I'd like to say, isn't this a marvelous concept to be having a face-to-face -face conversation? I want to thank Councilmember Florine. Um, <laughs> I don't even have face-to-face -face communication with my children. We text each other, <laughs> email each other. So, I mean, it's so amazing to be able to be in touch. So I just really um, welcome the opportunity to be here. And Cynthia and I have uh, com had conversations, uh, several uh, long conversations. We've exchanged um, email. And uh, there are other council members. Uh, Mark Elrich is also looking at the situation. Clearly, there's a big problem. Uh, with respect to foreclosures, with respect to bankruptcies, with respect to uh, short sales, with, with people who don't pay the kind of interest. There's no simple solution. We are gathering information. Um, Peter Dramalski, who, who runs the CCLC program, uh, is an absolute expert on this. I'd also like to introduce the chair of the CCOC commission, Elizabeth Malloy, who's here. Uh -huh. These are issues that, that are very well known. I think Vicki, who's too back, who was also a chair, is gonna bring up some of the same issues. So there is no simple solution, uh, but everyone is aware of it. And uh, you know, a third of the population live in, in common ownership communities. Uh, these are many governments. Uh, that have been created by, by, by Montgomery County, so clearly the county is responsible for them. Uh, but we're, you know, we're very fortunate to even have a commission on common ownership communities. It was a novel concept created over 20 years ago, um, and they're working to re resolve disputes as an alternative dispute resolution mechanism, but also to deal with these very difficult issues that, that Cynthia has raised and, and others have as well. I, I think we have some other uh, comments here. Um, I know this is a tough subject for a lot of you because I saw a lot of heads nodding while you were talking. There's a reality problem that we have in collecting assessments, or that you have. And part of that reality is the homeowner might not have the money. So it's not worth going after him. And in addition, the other problem is that given the current 
property situation after the subprime market crash, your units are simply not worth the mortgages. So you have it's a question of how much do you want to spend for very little return. And, and uh, let, let, why don't you let her have the mic there so she can respond. But once um, the courts rule that, for, for example, I'm referring to right now, to two cases where people declared bankruptcy by choices they made in their life. Their debt is cleared. They get to remain in their condominium units. And again, once again, we have no clout to go after them to to pay for, to recover any fees from the past that were unpaid, or to recover any fees for the future that may be unpaid. I think that's a misimpression. I'm not a bankruptcy expert, but my understanding of this situation is bankruptcy only forgives the debts that ran up, up to the date of the filing of bankruptcy. And any assessments that fall due after the person files for bankruptcy are not forgiven. You can go after that person for not paying his assessments after he files for bankruptcy. Um, the other point I'd like to make is that most experts recommend that once a person is two months late, you start to take legal action and send the warning letters and follow it up with a contract lien. If somebody has run up $50,000 in debt, it makes me wonder why he's run up so much before the association gets him in court. Now, you have to understand the third fact. There is something in Maryland called the Contract Lien Act that only protects homeowner associations and condominium associations. But under the Contract Lien Act, once a person owes money, you give him a 30-day notice, and if he doesn't pay up, you have the right to put a lien on his property. And that lien might not be worth much right now, but it has to be paid off when the property is sold. We have Mr. Nel Rick Nelson is here from Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Let's see what uh, he can offer here, too. I don't want to address the issue of, co of trying to collect the debt after it's reached $50,000, but the, the point I want to reach is one, we're trying to determine to what extent you've got that kind of a problem within the HOAs and the condo associations. We've had some difficulty getting responses to that because we want to know what the level of problem is in the county. The county has uh, funded for the last five years three counseling organizations in the county to work with families who are facing delinquency in one form or another. And one of the things that I've said to many folks is when they start missing their condo fees, that's the first step toward foreclosure. What we want to do is to get in and help those families before they get too far into the, the situation. What we'd like to see is if, if homeowner associations and condo associations would work with some of our counseling agencies to provide, they provide free service. And I see one of our counseling agencies here. Uh, we have three, we have got offices in Gaithersburg, uh, Germantown, Wheaton, and Silver Spring. Uh, and the important thing is to get to the family before they get too deep, try to provide some financial counseling, help them out. The other is there are some situations where we've been able to work with some condo associations to get banks to help them to get a loan until they can get some of those things paid. So there are some remedies for some of this. I'm not going to the legal problems that you've got in terms of the expense of, of foreclosing. But the big issue is to try to get to it before it happens. And the other problem we've got in the county in terms of foreclosures, it's easy for us to determine foreclosed single family homes because you see them on the street, but we can't see the foreclosures in, in your condos. Uh, so we need to hear more from you in terms of what really happened in your association. So you, have you tried to contact the uh uh, property managers, or who are you contacting? We've tried to contact some uh, homeowner associations. We've been, in a couple of cases, we've worked with the homeowner association to provide some services, but we'd like to hear more from homeowner associations. We're willing to have our counseling agencies work with you. So what you're hearing is Rick Nelson, Department of Housing and Community Affairs, wants to know about these problems so they can track them 
and uh, follow up to the extent they can. My email is rick.nelson at montgomerycountymaryland.gov. MontgomeryCountyMD.gov. That's how you reach it. It's very long. It's annoying, but it's easy to get. If you get the name right, uh, you're good. So, I, our condo association, I'm sure many others, welcome as much education as possible to address this issue. However, to the county council members, I want to reinforce mm -hmm. that the serious problem. Street is the laws in Montgomery County and in the state of Maryland do not support condo associations in recovering con unpaid condo fees, no matter if you start from day one or you start later in the game. And so that is the issue as so, okay. we need, you need to look at, and I want to help you do it, sure. and how can we work together? Thank you. Uh, well, we will follow up with you and with the, with the Office of um, um, Communities of common, on common Ownership to understand um, the extent of the limitations and where the loopholes are. I heard something about a state law issue, uh, which maybe is something we could support you on. Uh, and uh, we will uh, uh, ask uh, Mr. Nelson and um, the, the office to um, provide us with some more information about this. So we'll put this on the list. Uh, I'm not sure we get done tomorrow, but uh, uh, but that's clearly a, um, an ongoing problem for many, many, many communities. Thank you, Ms. Uh, um, Councilman Flore. Uh, thank you so much for gathering this uh, meeting. And I don't go to church, I'm not a really religious person, but I really thank you tonight because the two people in front of me, they actually um, brought my questions. Oh, good. Uh, with the Asian American Homology Counseling, I'm President and CEO. I'm here with one of my housing counselor. And actually, my question is that I was going to ask you that if you are aware of what kind of big problem that we have with the HOA and condo fee default. And then she, she asked the same questions and brought it up. So uh, would you mind if I um, give them some information and see what Good. we are up to? Um, we have actually come up with about a year and a half um, you know, this program we the only the organization in this whole country, I tell you, whole country, that we are piloting and offer this program is called Home Savers. And I hope that a lot of you received our flyer because we sent out so many email blasts and then we also, last week, we sent out about 1,100 mails to all the property managers. If, we are, if you are on the list of the, our planning and recreation list as a property managers, you should have received our flower, I mean, flyers and information. This program, what it does is that, I know I just overheard somebody saying that there was a lot of um, help for the mortgage defaults and stuff like that, but there's nobody's helping with the condo HOA fee default, which is true. However, this, uh, the, we received a small grant to help out homeowners who are in default and condo HOA fee default uh, fees. And it's not a lot of amount, it's a small amount. We give up to about $4,000. It's not a grant, it's a small micro loan. However, there's no interest. We give them up to two years to pay back and based on their budget, their, their affordability. So we work with them budget and we review their finances and everything we go through. And then we make sure that payment is affordable. And we reach out to all the property managers CCAC, and we even put our ad on community newsletters and paperless airplanes. And then we send our email to 12,000, our distribution list. And then we also mailed you all these things. Okay, we well, having, thank you. Yes, and then we also reach out to the attorneys. Attorneys who put, work with you and put the uh, uh, lien on the house. And we also reach out to them. And as of today, we have only given out uh, six people, right? So we have this program is available for you. And then we're going to leave out this brochure, if you don't mind. OK. So we have a, have a resource and uh, some yes. actual help. So, so, yes. so that's terrific. Thank you very much. Yes. That's right. terrific. Yes. Excellent. Hi. My name is Vicki Vergani. I'm with Glenway Gardens Condo Association. And I'm the person who sent the cross email. My concern is that Montgomery County is, they can find us when it's time to buy a defibrillator. They did not find us to let us comment on it when we only have four or five people a day at the pool for three months. But they found us to get us to purchase one and to maintain it. 
They found us for fire protection fees, which ran $8,000 for our little community the first year, and you're all paying. They are finding us every year for at least some type of annual recurring fee or a one-time purchase, and we are not having input. So that was why I was upset when I sent in my email, because there was just, no, I, just a change in the title. CCOC that will not allow the CCOC to award attorney fees to the prevailing party in a dispute which concerns me, but I just want to raise the issues. I was uh, attending the foreclosure task force hearing several years ago. Condos were not even mentioned at the first several meetings, and I raised hell because park and planning didn't have a single number on how many condos there are. But all the housing now is condos. They're trying to get dense. It's getting more and more condos. These apartments are being built as mixed use. You need to understand what the WSSC issue is with that. They are charging those facilities with commercial in the bottom and residential in the top, the highest rate you can charge for water sewer because they are not separated. It is tens, 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars to separate the systems. Now they're building all these apartment buildings, mixed use, that's what park and planning wants. But they're not assuring that they separate those sewer systems, those water sewer systems. They are gonna convert those to condos someday. And again, the problem is going to keep on going. I just want to major, raise some issues we need to look at in the, in the condo communities. Condos, the older ones are master metered. You wonder how people get a $15,000 condo fee uh, bill because it, their condo fee is six to $800 a month. It isn't like $25 in an HOA where you're mowing the lawn. So it's very easy to run these up and we are getting no protection and no help in master metered communities. We have problems with WSSC, we have problems with PEPCO, we have problems with the Public Service Commission. We all pay into the surcharge, but we don't get a penny back. We can't get our appliances rebated. We cannot get on the Empower Maryland program because our people don't have an individual utility bill. We cannot get financial assistance through the Maryland Energy Assistance Program because our people don't have an individual utility bill. But I, as a property manager, can tell you exactly what they're paying. But we need help. We need a priority lien bill with some teeth. The county council has refused to support it. I was on the commission. They refused to support it. The county executive refused to support it. We have people making 3% down payments. Once again, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are running rampant. They're requiring us to put 10% budget line items for capital reserves, no matter how much you have. And they're the ones who created the problem to begin with, and nobody's going to qualify for the loans because associations are not putting aside 10% line budget line items. These are serious public policy issues. I also would like to have the council take a look at the Housing Opportunities Commission because we have nothing but criminal activity moving into our community when there's an HOC unit, and it's not getting addressed. I had to move out of my condo for six months because I had to testify against the HOC people in my building that were selling drugs in the hallway. We've got, um, there are trespassing is an issue. There are about, I listed just 25 issues. The water quality protection charge. Condos paid $30 a year for the water quality protection charge and townhomes only paid 20 bucks. Our condos are stacked in a stack of three. We have a smaller footprint altogether than a townhouse has. And that still isn't getting corrected. I'm asking the council to take and set up a task force to deal with issues related to condominiums, especially looking at master metered issues, because we are spending and wasting thousands and thousands a year. And I, Peter, I have to tell you, when people file bankruptcy, by law, the date it is to stop is to start paying again, but they don't. The reality is that they don't. We are sucking up from many of these people $500, $600, $700 a month that we have to pay to cover them. So we have a serious financial issue. Um, I don't, I'm also concerned that they're building all these small condominium associations, uh, small townhouses, eight per, for uh, a townhouse association. Many of them can't support themselves. This is not the way to do development. Parks and Plannings needs to look at some of the issues around HOAs and condominiums. Don't build these small things. You've got to make sure that the utilities are separated so that we don't have problems in the future. There are a, a lot of issues, policy issues we've got to take a look at. I'm trying to smile. Oh, you're doing. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> I just hope that we'll. Can we have some ex extra support. cookies for Vicky? Okay, uh, I thank you very much, Nancy. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> oh no. Uh, well, uh, we've touched a nerve, and that's my job. Uh, so I uh, thank you for that list of things. Um, 
with there's some serious problems on that list. Uh, and I'm really concerned about the meter situation. I'm looking at the park and planning people to ask you to put that on your list. Uh, and the uh, uh, um, uh, Commission on Common Ownership, uh, is this on your agenda to worry about these things? Well, let's put it on your agenda and uh, we will, uh, uh, Vicki has proposed a, a, a path to look at to work out these things. I think that's a very helpful suggestion. So thank you very much. And let's have a round of applause for Vicki for all that hard work she's done. And I did not consider that a cranky. Did I say cranky? Uh, well, you're a little cross, but <laughs> I, I hear from many. That's why many people communicate with us. But it, it, it's, uh, it's a testament to really what a great community this is that you have all taken the time to do what you do with you, for your HOAs and your condo associations and to worry about these things, which are huge things and huge out-of-pocket issues for you. Next. Hi, I'm Joyce Siegel. I'm on the board of the Forum Condominium, and I endorse almost all of everything yeah. that he said. <laughs> I've been working with an informal alliance of master metered condos. Ah. And we, we meet every other month, and we've been trying to learn how to save energy and be more energy efficient in our buildings. Um, we represent probably 22,000 units in the county. And I'm hoping that the county will look at something that New York State did, which is help master metered condos um, become sub-metered mm -hmm. and help us lower our utility bills. Master metered condos pay 20 to 25 percent more for energy than individual metered buildings. And we could help you with energy efficiency in the county. We could help you meet your carbon footprint goals, but we need your help. Sure. Uh, Steve, uh, would, does DOP have any, uh, DEP uh, have any resources for these sorts of energy efficiency initiatives? If we don't, maybe we should. Well, PEPCO is beginning to look. PEPCO is looking at it. I'll have to get back to you on that. Sure, sure. Fair, fair enough. Uh, but that's very helpful. So there is a group now looking at this, uh, this meter issue. So that's helpful to know. Good evening, uh, Honorable Council Member Nancy Florine. My name is Frank Cockrell. I'm Vice President of Calvin Citizens Association. A number of you know about Calvin, I'm sure. Uh, a fair number don't. Calverton is right at Bridge Cheney Road and Route 29, which is not a good spot for Montgomery County. That is not Calverton, but we say that because that's the entrance. Well, it's the edge. It is uh, Cherry Hill yeah. Road uh, over to Bridge Cheney and from Fairland to Gunpowder. Uh, to cut to the chase, I've got three or four issues, and I will try to group them. Calverton is I, I have been vice president for going on five years. Bless you. Very active association. And uh, what's been mentioned uh, on a number of areas, I'm not going to repeat them, but crime, blight, uh, some decay, compliance issues, uh, plan, uh, zoning, uh, ordinance infractions, uh, rentals, uh, and so on. Uh, with that said, uh, Calverton is still a wonderful place. We, it is the home of present council members from, uh, and delegates uh, from Prince George's and Montgomery, as you well know, uh, Ann Kaiser and the Prisoners. Uh, now, now, have you met Mr. Um, uh, okay. Uh -huh. Now be kind. Be kind. Okay. I've traded some things. I think I've given him. Uh, some uh, good things to help with things. He has certainly given tremendous response to us. In the good. same breath, I want to say police officers, uh, fire department, and sheriffs, and teachers, and so on, in these lean times. I'm just mentioning that because that's the great things we have. We've got challenges. We've got issues. What I would like to know, besides some of the drug overall plight and things, is, well, Major crime uh, is being said to be down in Prince George's and Montgomery. Uh, but to back up, we're 8,000 homes 
split about equally between Prince George's and Montgomery. We have 8,000 plus or minus residents, plus we don't know how many illegal renters. This is a pervasive problem, particularly in, let's say, the lower eastern part and uh, throughout uh, a number of areas of both counties. Well, uh, particularly what uh, I want to say is, do you have any kind of plan or forward-looking process to go to the issue of illegal rentals, illegal occupancy, safety, all that goes with it, the extra traffic, the vehicle part, because it is random. Let, let, let me ask uh, uh, Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Yes. Mr. Nelson, to, to uh, speak to how we handle housing complaints. Uh, and I know they do their very best to uh, address them. A couple years ago, we passed some additional uh, re uh, laws that were intended to be responsive to that. Uh, Mr. Nelson. We are continuing to try to determine all those units that have more people in them than they should or where are those units where they are renting and they're not licensed for rental. Uh, we've actually, uh, the council gave us some money to hire an extra person this year to go after some and we have. But I, again, I have to say that we depend upon the community and the neighborhoods to let us know. Call us and let us know that you think that there's some overcrowding or there's somebody who's illegally renting a unit. We will in fact go to the property and inspect it and take the appropriate action. We can't, we can't have, we don't have enough staff to go around and just knock on doors. So we do depend upon the county, but we're trying as hard as we can to ensure that they do comply with the law. Okay. And another question? Yes, one more question. Yeah. Uh, is this, uh, is there a nuisance abatement or, I know you've got some good pro bono legal services in East County, Drew, in fact, put us in, but we, we know these things, but do you have an overall nuisance abatement thing where there are such things that the inspectors can't cover, but it, it's an ongoing public nuisance which doesn't get addressed? You mean a resource for dealing with things that aren't covered by county regs? Uh, well, let's say there are regs, but uh, they may be so low on the priority list, and I uh, don't understand the legal yeah. workforce and the extra time and effort that uh, I, I think Mr. Nelson's response would be the same for that, that issue as well. Right. So let them know, and they'll do their best. I know they try. Hi, I'm Jean Simpson with Oak Fair Homeowners Association of Burnsville, Maryland. We have our share of delinquencies. We, we do, that's been mentioned and we're all struggling. Yeah. We have tried with our homeowners to just make a payment plan of anything that we can get from them. We do have uh, a, an allowance in our bylaws that allows us to make parking regulations. So we take their parking away when they don't pay for three months. And that is a big incentive to get your parking back since parking is a premium in the neighborhood. Tip to others, that's interesting. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted Mr. Domalski's office has been wonderful. We've had a couple of times where I've been in the cases with him that they've been very good. I have um, two questions. One, is there any plan when they do the development that will extend Cedar Tree um, into PG County for any realignment with McNew or widening that for the light coming out? That light coming out right now is very hard to get out in the morning. You're waiting five to 10 minutes because they have the traffic set up to go 29 east, uh, you know, back and forth. So McNew comes out on that. That's the only mm -hmm. entrance onto the highway. It's very difficult to get out. Um, That's one I think we're gonna have to get back to you. Um, we, does that ring a bell with you, Bruce? Well, it does ring a bell with us, so we'll have to, oh, uh, Jeru knows, come on down, Jeru. Um, Jeru, yes, it is on the list, and we just actually just called it in. I received this uh, request uh, last week. We did call the, uh, uh, the department, so it is on the list. We're going to take a look at it, and I'll give you my card. You can follow up with me, and then I could give an update on it here. Okay, thank you. My other concern is wildlife. 
geese, and beavers. And a year and a half. You know, that makes me feel better because <laughs> we don't have many beaver complaints. Geese and deer and rabbits, yes, we but have not deer beaver. And rabbits too, but they're, they're, I mean, they're manageable. <laughs> but the, the beavers, a year and a half to two years ago, the county cleaned out a storm drain management. And when they did that, they did not relocate the beavers. Uh -huh. Those beavers said, hey, look at this storm drain management across the street. <laughs> and proceeded <laughs> to clog us up and take down every tree around our area. And the We probably said, issued a fine. Um, well, <laughs> they said, that's your problem. That's not ours. But you can't kill them. You have to relocate them. They're, they're protected, but then we're told they're a nuisance. OK, guys. So what do we do with our beaver problem? We, we don't have a good answer for this one. <laughs> um, we sometimes we put things we call beaver deceivers around. The <laughs> really? We call them beaver deceivers? That's what we call them. Um, but beavers are a continual problem. We can't kill them. We try to, we, we, there are times when we try to relocate them, but it's, it's just a continual problem that we, we deal with on an as-needed basis. There's not, a, there's not a good solution to, to the beaver. So do they call animal control, or do they call you? Uh, they, if it's related to a stormwater facility that gets clogged, that would be DEP. If it's, if it's, relate, if it's not related to a stormwater facility, I'm not sure. You had to pay for it. So we have to trap them and relocate them at our expense. Yeah, you know, what we, the 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 county's the official county responsibility is for structural maintenance, and so beavers are not considered structural maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> I know there are times when we do when we do relocate, and, and we're, or we work with the community. Okay, well, I think this is a problem uh, that we need to. I don't know, but. Well, my other question. Okay. The biggest complaint with geese. Because we don't have Canadian geese, we have Burdensville geese. They've been born and bred for years. The county tells us always we have to cut everything down around the storm drain management pond. But when we do this, we get more geese. Now, we recently let it grow up. They'll probably tell us to cut it down soon. Um, but in growing, letting the, the, the weeds grow up and the, the flowers grow Keeps up. the geese away? Keeps the geese away. Okay, Steve, can you agree that they can grow their stuff? <laughs> Do you need a regulation to make that happen? <laughs> Problem solved. OK. Uh, Nick Rodonic, Derwood Station South, uh, small HOA. Uh, we got burned by, the, uh, by a resident who went, I guess, into bankruptcy. The house got foreclosed, and we lost fees. and. Mm -hmm. fees and lean costs not forget that um, uh, more dry question uh, I look on the county zoning not zoning map, the computer GIS map that shows zoning and everything mm -hmm. and the allocation for the roadway is 70 feet which goes seems to go from the inside of one sidewalk over to the inside of the other sidewalk the grass area between the street and the sidewalk is that ours is that yours oh that's a good philosophical question the grassy area between the street and the sidewalk. Who's in charge? Is this a maintenance issue? Uh, Question? Yeah, or just general? When we were trying to make various plans, maintenance and stuff. And I think it's a fair question. Mr. Johnson. So you're saying that the, the right of way goes from the inside of the sidewalk? The right of way is 70 feet. Uh -huh. The street is 45, so it's like 10 feet on either side. It's a grass strip. Just the inside of the sidewalk. So the sidewalk is outside Sorry, of it. Well, it's the outside of the sidewalk. Yeah, well, typically the green strip between the sidewalk and the curb or the street is typically in the right of way. Yeah, okay. But it's typically maintained mode by the adjoining property owner. Cool. No, okay. Um, there's that's a legal issue. <laughs> it, it's, if it's if it's dedicated as right of way, the underlying fee of the land is usually owned by the original property owner, but it's usually dedicated for public purposes. Um, I, it, it, there there are different situations. I would say the county pretty much owns it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they're not going to maintain it, yeah. is what they're gonna, he's going to say. Well, it, that was his nice way of saying that. Uh, another minor question is uh, there are two cement plants on South Lawn Drive, and the trucks, as they come out, spill and splatter concrete down. Really? 
all the way to, and, and it just radiates in the paths that they go. And so as I drive down, uh, I've just changed jobs, so now I drive down uh, uh, Goody a lot, and and, it, it, and it, as far as you go in, in whatever direction the trucks are going away from the thing, there's just splattered concrete. You get these long strips of, of, uh, of concrete, like uh, rumble strips, yeah. and in a few places it's got these big mounds of this. The trucks are just stopped. Okay. So I've been in contact with the highways department a couple of times, and I've been goading them by email. Um, but, you know, I got an That's excuse an issue. that the grinding machine broke down. And then they did some work on Norbeck Road at uh, Cross with um, Baltimore, mm -hmm. put in a sidewalk. When they did that, they spilled concrete all over everything. Now, I caught them one day, and there's a long, fresh strip. I gave them a call. I said, get down there, you know, if you want this to get the stuff while it's still fresh. And they did. Uh, but there's, there's more concrete spilled everywhere, so... So that's something that the uh, county needs to be keeping an eye on the for the both the guys, yeah. from yeah, the yeah, contractors yeah. and the uh, plants from the cement plant and it just you can track them, huh? Good to know, uh, Bruce. You keeping track of that? Thank you. Thank you very much for your eagle eye, sir. I'm a little shorter, so I don't know if you can hear me. Um, Marcy Brodsky, Montrose Forest, right off of Montrose Road. I have two questions, maybe three. The first one is the um, pedestrian crosswalk going across Montrose Road safety-wise right by B'nai Israel. I don't know if there's any law enforcement that's ever done to protect, to protect the pedestrians trying to cross because vehicles do not stop. Big issue, countywide. Uh, so you're in the middle there? I'm in Montrose Forest, directly across from, Mont from B'nai Israel. From B'nai Israel, yeah. And there's a crosswalk right there by a metro <laughs> that crosses right to um, B'nai Israel's parking lot. Yeah. So there are signs up, nobody stops. So, I mean, I've counted 15, 20 cars. Sounds like uh, uh, this is a place for the police to do one of those, uh, um, we gotcha. I'd love to volunteer to be part of a sting operation. <laughs> uh, we have a suggestion for a sting. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's just a crosswalk. That, that continues to be one of the challenges uh, for the county, and I think for police officers, maybe uh, one of you could come up and say, talk a little bit about the challenge of, of how you address this problem, which is a countywide problem, uh, pedestrians trying to get across the street and a crosswalk. Good evening. I'm uh, Captain Fenner from the 1st District, and you're in our district, and we'll stop it immediately. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I know they have some officers that work off duty there and, and patrol, but also we'll have some first district officers to come down and take a look at it. I can't promise every day, but we will take a look at it. But this is countywide, like the councilwoman said, and uh, Nancy, and we're working on it. But again, uh, with the new initiatives, I think we're going to make some inroads with the the painting and the Department of Transportation has been very uh, responsive. So give us a chance and we'll work on it. Okay. Okay. You said you had a few other questions? I sure. Have, I have one other um, question. Um, it might be in the EP's area. We have in Montrose Forest a running creek in our development that is off of a watershed area. And there are huge trees, a couple of them came down <clears throat> during the derecho. And I can't find out who owns that property as far as marking it, cleaning it up. Uh, somebody came through, um, put a whole bunch of ribbons, pink ribbons, orange ribbons on trees, nailed them into the road. Nobody's claiming ownership. So I'm just trying to find out if there's some way we can try and figure out who owns that property to clean it up, get the fallen trees out of there. Um, replant. I, I'm looking at Steve here. Um, I, I don't know. Um, Depends on where it is. Of course, if someone started looking at it, it suggests that it, someone knows they own it. Depends who owns the property. Yeah. It could be a DFT right away. It could be a park's property. It's okay, no more runarounds. Okay, we're going to get you the answer. You, I'll give you my card and we can yeah. at least tell you who owns the property. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here's, here we go. If you want to find out who owns the property, you can go to the finance department's website. And on the right is a column 
and one of the items on it is view or pay real property tax bill. You can search by the address and it will tell you who is the owner and what his address is. That's public information. There's no now, if there's no address, if, if there is an address that would help, otherwise I'm not sure how they would. Yeah, there was that, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for hosting this. Okay, well good, good, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Carol Petroff. I'm representing Pliers Mill Crossing, which is just south of Wheaton Plaza. Mm -hmm. Development going on there in Wheaton. First, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity. I wish I knew about these sorts of things many years ago. Well, let me try. Ironically, I'm here because of an invitation sent to me by the attorney whom we paid for over about an annual year's budget worth and didn't manage to get one thin dime from the owner whom we were suing. So we followed mm. the rules we did as we were told. Now we're a broke association. Mm. So now we have still three owners in a very tiny 16 unit condominium. And if you guys do the math, three divided by 16 is 19%. And everyone's shaking their heads because they know that after you cross 15%, you are part of a condominium where not only will mortgage lenders not approve a loan, but you can't, um, you can't get your FHA approval anymore. And while some people might philosophically disagree with putting 3% down in a small condominium in an area with lots of young people trying to you know, get a starter home, that's a great way to do it. So now we have what's called toxic property. And while our assessments are up there and we love living where we live, if we get an opportunity to move on, if we need to leave our, our home, we can't sell it. We can't mm. sell it. And that, of course, is bad moving forward as we build more condominiums and we introduce this concept, going back to the issue of having teeth and where do we go for help. The one takeaway I'd love to have before I leave tonight is exactly who, do you, who should we send our sob stories to? Because you want to hear from us. We've tried to reach out. We're not quite sure who we're reaching out to, but we definitely don't have any more money because we've already spent it. And it's in the county court system. Yeah. Uh, the lady yeah. we sued had a better lawyer She's got a long record here in the court system. She knew it inside and out. She knew exactly what she was doing. But then we also have the guy who's in foreclosure, and we have the uh, owner who's renting her property. And that's the problem is now it's toxic, and the people who do pay their bills, who work hard, who live in their homes and are wonderful neighbors, if an opportunity comes their way, they can't sell it. Or they'd have to sell it. Here's where the toxic problem comes in. They'd have to sell it for cash. They'd have to sell it for cash. So everyone who's been in a situation where they're desperate will lower the price to whatever they can do to get a cash offer. And then, of course, you know what that's going to do for the assessments in the neighborhoods. Yeah. Well, let me say this. Until we've figured out whether we do a task force or how we handle it, send me your sob stories. And we will keep them in a file. And we will see. I can't promise you that we have an answer. But we will try to uh, get this organized in a way that's responsive to everyone's needs. I, I think that's it's clear that something we need to be prepared for. And park and planning needs to be prepared for this for the future because this is where we're going. And here's Mr. Nelson. Shall I have him send it to you? <laughs> I, well, that's true. That is true. Well, the, the, the question I wanted to raise with you is, um, yeah. We've looked at this issue, and I mean, it is a serious issue in terms of FHA, yeah. Fannie Mae, and Freddie, and the inability of people to sell or refinance. Uh, but we also have found that a very large percentage of HOAs and condo associations have not sought to renew their FHA approval. Yeah. Well, what, I'm, what I was going to say is, if you have tried and you've been turned down, let us know. Because we're trying, to, again, to gather that information so that we can go to walk to uh, FHA in Washington and, wor and, and work with Fannie to see if we can do something about this. Well, because the guidelines, the guidelines, we wouldn't. Well, we, we here have friends that we will uh, pursue these issues with once we have an organized response. The issue that FHA has finally decided that they're going to enforce stuff that's been on the books for 100 years that they never looked at, and everybody's getting caught in the switches right now. Yeah. So we also can't have a pending litigation, yeah. which is the other catch 20. Well, part of the problem and we're going to figure out how we address it. Okay, Bob Hydorn, president of Montgomery Village. 
Uh, of course, Nancy knew I was going to be here up here at some point tonight. Uh, the first thing I have actually is a request for Bruce Johnson. And I'm not sure it's you, it's Department of Transportation. Marinelli Drive, the first intersection behind, right behind NRC. Can we please get a four-way stop sign put in there? Somebody's going to get killed at that intersection. It's probably going to be me on my way to Harris Teeter. Uh, you're wrong. Mr. Hartman's going to ask you a question. I actually had a conversation with uh, Fred Lees from DOT the other day, and they, they <laughs> said they are looking at comprehensively at Marinelli Drive there and at Neville. Right. So uh, something might be in the works. I'm waiting to hear from him what it's going to be. But stop sign obviously is a, is a clear. Uh, and works beautifully. Neville yeah. works perfect. There you go. Then I go to the, to the village. And where do we start? Rain tax, you've heard about. I will say one way that we get rid of geese, there is a grape and water mixture that can be sprayed on fields and in areas. It does not hurt them. However, they'll come down to land and they will not touch it. They go right back up in the air. Okay, I uh, share your secret with everyone. It's out there. It's expensive. It hmm. is expensive, but it does work. I would like to thank Nancy and the county staff, the council, the executive for all that you do for all of us. We have in Montgomery Village, I would say, and Eric or Peter probably can answer best, I believe we're the largest HOA in Montgomery County. We have a little over 12,000 units. And you want some write-offs, we've got some write-offs. However, in looking at, it's correcting itself very slowly, but it's correcting itself in the right direction. We have put in, when a unit sells, whether it be an entire apartment project or an individual townhouse or home, a capital contribution fee. Hmm. And that is for capital improvements and capital expenditures. It has to be used, again, there's legal ramifications, how it can be used, how it can't be. Columbia probably, Maryland was probably the luckiest community HOA in the state of Maryland. They have first lien on their properties. And they got that because the Rouse Corporation, when it was first formed, put that in the documents before the first house ever got sold. And I'm in an HOA in Preston County, West Virginia, which has about 3,000 units, and the county, not the state, Preston County has the same thing, only it was only put in about five years ago. Hmm. So I mentioned it to Eric, and I will get you all that information on Preston County as to how they did it, because it didn't involve the state. Hmm. Okay. Web track, it's well underway by the looks. Please, as you've been doing, keep us all informed. M83, I uh, won't get into all the details, but of course we only want, our Montgomery Village Foundation is in favor of alternate one, two, and five. And with that, again, I'll thank you. And I need to thank one other person personally, and that's Kathy Matthews for all that she does for our upcounting. She does. And it's she does not a good job. But she's always there. Yes, indeed she is. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Mr. Link. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, very glad to be here. I'm one of the homes corporations that Bob mentioned in Montgomery Village, or the East Village. Uh, we do have many, many concerns, but I'll just cover a couple of them. One is the fact that M83 is a county road. Uh, we're very concerned about alternate four that Bob mentioned, about going through some of our homes and right through our back door, when it's already been put on about five other master plans throughout the community. So we really want the county to really take a serious look at this, especially if they're going to spend so much money on all the studies that have been going on for years and years. You heard about the roadway reimbursement. That's yeah. really hurting us at this time of the year for all of our streets that have to be redone and re-looked at. We're trying to do everything we can to cover them cover up some of the cracks and try to extend the life of the roads. But everybody uses those roads. It's a public road. Uh, although we own it, 
everybody still use it. The fire people use it, the police people use it, anybody in the county can come and drive through our streets. So it's a big, big problem. One of the big concerns I have is the grant program. We put a state grant in recently as an HOA, we received a matching fund grant for new lighting. Uh, we're putting in those lights. We're now going to do the entire community of LED lights. Great news, but I just was told by the state delegates that HOAs don't qualify anymore. So we want the county to find out why that is, because that's really beneficial. To H us. under the grant. You mean the under bond the bill? The bond grant. Oh well, that's the state problem. Well, we think the county can help us. Ask them why HRAs now are being kicked out of the program and hmm. can't apply. So we will go look at the rain program because we do have lots of streets and lots of water running off of those streets. The issue that we're now facing is the county did pass a regulation that says if you work on electricity lights outside, that the power has to be turned off. And that's a big issue because all of our lights are hooked up to one big central site on PEPCO. We don't have smart meters yet. And it's an area that I think- Well, that, that's gotta be a building code. Could that be a building code issue? It's, what, it's already been built. This issue of turning off the, uh, that, I didn't do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is, I didn't do that. Uh, one of the issues that we have is- We'll every, follow up with that one. Every community we have um, has two car spots for every home. Some of these people that are coming in on the homes corporations or renters that are moving in now, they have four and five cars. Mm -hmm. It's becoming a real big problem. We don't know where they can park, and they start taking other people's parking spaces, and your neighbors get all upset. So it's becoming a big problem when HO, uh, the housing department puts people into the homes. You want to make sure that there's a family going in there that hopefully doesn't have five and six cars moving into those townhouses. And last but not least, noise issues is becoming a big problem, especially at the air park and flying over our homes. These touch and goes are very, very close to our houses. They're flying at five to 6,100 feet rather than 1,000 feet, and it's becoming a big issue. And it's one of the things I'll be coming up and talking with Craig Rice here in the, coming up in the next couple of months. Sure, 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 so we sure. we want your support in that. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much. Oh, and we'll look into the, uh, that issue. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, you have the last word. It's nine, a little after nine o'clock. Constantly amaze me. Ah. Wonderful session. Uh, I see here Ken Hartman and Peter Dramowski who have been great assistants to me. I live in the Kenwood condominium on River Road and I'm on the board. And uh, our pressing problem is we can't take Ride On to Bethesda. We can take it to Rockville, we can take it to Sibley, we can go to Friendship Heights, but we can't go to our own hometown. And I want to know who I can talk to. The second problem is we need a stop light at Butler Road where- uh, Butler and River. Butler and River. Yeah. Um, so so uh, Bruce, can you uh, get back to him on the, well, for, forward that to our bus people uh, for right on? Sure. Bus. Rare error earlier. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that's it for the lifetime, huh? Well, yes. You asked about a bike path on River Road? No, no. no. Goldsboro. Road. We do have a project that's about to start going between MacArthur and River Road. And I'll get your contact information in our facility planning program. We work with the communities on how to do that. And so we'll get in touch with you and get you involved in the planning process. Yeah, I thought that, that, I thought that sounded familiar. Well, listen, everyone, thank you very much. Um, I, I, this is, we've got a lot of great government uh, staff here tonight. I, I hope you uh, have seen a face to the phone call or email that you may have pursued. Now you know who you can forward, uh, uh, send your questions to, please, Please weigh in on things, though. Please let us know. Let me know how I can help you. That's my job, and that's what makes, uh, makes me be able to sleep at night. Every so often, we get to solve a problem. So thank you very much for being here, and we'll keep it up. And uh, if, please sign in if you haven't done that so we can uh, share with you the results. Thank you very much.